That was your welcome message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a quorum. We saw you coming. <laughs> I think it's in the afternoon. Yeah. If you're available, I can see if there's an opening. No, no, no. You want to sit up here? I don't think he wants to. He wants to be near me. Morning, coming more widespread. All right, I'm going to call the meeting to order uh, to start. I don't think we have any committee reports that we need to review at the moment. Um, so I'm going to skip right to the action items. Uh, we had discussed uh, at the I don't actually don't know if I wasn't at the last meeting, but the meeting before about the golf carts as far as what we wanted to do. Um, did we have any further information on that as far as lease versus buy versus the amount? I think that was kind of the ideas that we were discussing before we were going to recommend anything. We had that discussion at the last meeting, and I think Jim uh, Michael Cavage was tasked with giving us some numbers of what he thinks. Um, the golf course should purchase. We have 72 now, but 10 of, roughly 10 of those are the old golf carts, which are about, gas carts, which are about 15 years old. So I think what Jim is suggesting is that we get rid of all 72. The last time we already got rid of 62 and purchase a full 72. Jim, if, if you can kind of fill us in, that would be awesome. Yeah, currently with the uh, carts we do have um, on busy days, we're running out of carts by 11 o'clock. And like I mentioned at the uh, last meeting, that's running on 10 minute tea times where ideally we want to get to eight, nine minute. And then with larger outings, we can only accommodate 124 players versus 144 players without renting additional carts to accommodate. And then we're also using our uh, gas carts and then maintenance carts for volunteers to go around the property, which obviously is an ideal presentation we'd like to have. So are you looking for 72 golf carts plus additional the uh, 72, which we have now. So we have a, a fleet of 62 electric carts and about 10 gas. So would we keep the, we would keep the 10 gas ones just no. as we would we would trade them in. Just trade everything. Now I did promise one to uh, Enfield Area Rec. They have uh, one of our older ones, so they would just replace that one and keep that. I have a question for Jim. Um, Jim, is there any advantage to having more than 72 new carts, either to accommodate more players or to have a couple of spares in an event you get a couple of mechanical breakdowns? I mean, in an ideal world, but most courses, they uh, carry 72 carts. Okay. Thank you. What was the cost breakdown between lease versus buy we didn't review that um the if it was not right purchase that's a hundred and fifty uh well last last, bit. last time with just 62 cards i think the outright purchase was like one hundred and eighty thousand. that and was the, with the trade-ins with the trade-ins yeah so you get trade in with a lease because don't aren't the carts leased right now? Or are they purchased? We could. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we, these these carts I think were purchased, right? We can trade in our current fleet. Okay. Yeah, these ones are purchased. I think what it's a five four year or five year payoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so these carts have been paid off for, and we've had the current carts about eight years. Okay. <clears throat> so so sixty two carts cost us one hundred eighty thousand period or is there was there an additional 
uh, amount that we got for the trade -in? cart trade-ins. Yeah, there was. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, roughly forty thousand dollars on the trade-in. So that one eighty was what the net payment was, or it was one eighty minus forty that we got in return? So it was it, uh, the one eighty was the gross pay, gross amount, and then you you got the trade value. Okay. I apologize, I didn't bring those numbers with me. I had them at the last meeting. Well, my guess would be the gas cart, or we don't really know what the trade-in value is if the, the last time we did this. Yeah, I mean, you know, it depends on the wear and tear, and, and what we're hearing is our current fleet is not, not real great. Yeah. So that trade value might be smaller. Well, and if 180 was eight years ago, there's got to be some inflation cost for... Yeah, the newer carts are more expensive than what it was back in 2015. Um, so, yeah, the numbers are going to change some. Will we need additional charging uh, mechanisms? That's all included. Yeah, I think, I think it's part of, the, part of the per cart. Okay. But yes, they, they have to be, they would have to be changed out, I think, to, for the newer ones because they're different types of batteries. Yeah, these are the lithium batteries. The rep told uh, staff that the lithium batteries could last seven or eight years, I think. Yeah. Pro definitely five years. And he has seen some lasting seven, which is pretty much the lifespan of the cards. I think, Ryan, what we, I think what we need to do today, though, is we need to push something to the Board of Supervisors to send that bid out. Because we need those bids out after, the, well, we need it approved after the first meeting to get those out there so that we have the carts in time for next year. Yeah. That's even possible. <laughs> it's our best chance, but yes. Right, it's, <laughs> it's our best chance. We, would need, we need to get it started. Yeah. Uh, now, the, the rep uh, club cart did drop off a demo cart if you want to stop out the golf course and see it. It's in the, probably in the cart barn. Just ask Jim to take a look at it. It has all the bells and whistles on it, more than we would need, but uh, it's a, a good example. Does it have the GPS on it? What kind of bells and whistles? Yeah, <laughs> that one does. It has the GPS on it. Is that something Ryan and I could take out and maybe for two hours and while we're checking out other locations on the course? But it's not a GPS of the golf course. It will be. Should we should we get the units with it with the GPS units in it? It would uh, they would mark out the golf course, so we could uh, determine what areas could go fast, what could where it could go slow, mm. where they couldn't go at all. Uh, we can also use it for alerts. I would suggest once we get the bids written up is to do either one or the other. Uh, well, I should say do but both bids. With or without. With or that. without. Yeah. And see what the cost difference is and make your determination there. I, I would say from my own experience, I haven't seen a lot of public municipal golf courses that typically have that, at least in our, mm -hmm. our area. Um, but if it's not a huge added cost, then that might be a draw, but I don't, I don't really know. Yeah. Um, I have no idea either. Yeah. Jim, I don't know if you have any ideas of, of what those extra GPS units cost or are they more problems than they're worth? Um, the technology has come a long way since the last time I used those. But he said the uh, good thing with the uh, addition of those, the customer or the guest, there's a version that they would actually be charged to use it. So it can either be set up where they can use it all the time, we would pay the monthly fee, or it's where they would, uh, you know, swipe a card to use it, which uh, some courses have it set up that way. And now, Jim, you're referencing the GPS with regards to distant, like yardage. Correct. And I think what Cindy was saying was GPS with regards to... It's all the same. Rates. It's all the same thing? So we so we wouldn't be able to we wouldn't be able to utilize the radius option on it without letting them use the yardage option. Correct. 
Are you saying so they don't drive on the green? Right. So like if you go down like Heritage Hills, uh, if you start, if you get close to a green or close to a pond or any like out of bounds area, it shuts the cart down and you have to go backwards or it'll, or if you get to an area that they don't want you to be in, it'll shut the cart down to like minimal power till you get back into a safe zone. Is that a problem, Jim? Um, do you get a lot of carts on the green or in the ponds? <laughs> I hope not. No, we don't. <laughs> now, what uh, uh, staff said to me today was that we could also limit how fast they can go in the parking lot. Right. They tend to speed up out there. Right. And there's only one way in, one way out of that parking yeah. lot. So. The parking lot's tight if, yeah. the, if the lot's full. Yeah. And you have those little carts leaving in and out. It gets a little scary. I, I think there's pros and cons to the the added technology. I just worry about the added overhead cost for maintenance on things like that and software updates and things like that. But I don't know what the cost is for that. But I think plain and simple, if, if the fleet needs to be replaced, us as a board, we need to just say whether or not we, we need it replaced and then get more information to, to move forward. I would like to get more information because certainly if we're looking at an eight-year lifespan, technology is going to change. It'd be nice to have what we're able to get now as opposed to waiting eight years to be able to add it on finally yeah so if we're looking for a motion to replace the fleet right now yeah i mean um, do we I, I would i would make that motion before we make that motion do we want to discuss whether or not we do the extra 10 so go 62 to 72 i think you just have to i think you just have to do the whole fleet there's no reason to keep those gas carts so it would be a motion to replace the entire fleet and purchase lease 10 additional carts to bring the, the operational total to 72. Yeah, I would say push it to the Board of Supervisors to put a bid out for 72 carts. And then within that bid, the scope of it would be, you know, no GPS versus GPS. I'm sure they can give us two options there. Mm -hmm. So motion being to replace 72 cards? Yes, I, I, I think that's a, a good motion. Do I have a second? I'll, I'll second. Okay. Just one quick question. Is there any other options of it other than GPS that we should consider? The cart that is currently at the golf course, you'll notice it has an upgraded seat. Now, uh, Jim can weigh in on this, but the, the, the standard seat seems to be fine. They both tear, so. Um, yeah, the standard would be fine. And I think there was, this one also has a cover for the, for the clubs. Yeah, a rain cover, which really isn't needed. No, I'm not. I mean, are, are those I added, favor rain are those added costs, Jim, that you know of, or is that just kind of standard on them now uh that's an added cost just like sand bottles and uh, coolers i mean you can do a lot for add-ons but they're not really needed with the cooler cost we could see if blue collar wants to get in on that <laughs> it would help them yeah. Yeah, but why don't we just, why don't we make work forward to replace the fleet and then see what get the details see what there. details are available to us. I agree. For all. Right. Yeah. For all. Yeah. I'm sure that's pick from the menu. I'm sure that's an easy thing for like go or yeah. whoever it is like, Yamaha to, that, yeah. to give us that and be like, yeah, you know, it's ten dollars a cooler per cart. You know, ten dollars for the the uh, the shear that comes over for the clubs. Okay. When we put the bid out, it's going to be the easiest to put out one bit, two bit, one bit, and then an alternate bid. Now, I would, would hope that the alternate bid would be with the GPS units, but not the other stuff, because Jim feels it does, it's not needed. I would like, I mean, I would like to see what the cost is. Like, one thing, those rain covers are nice um, when it rains. Okay. Um, but, you know, if they're $30 per cart and we're buying 72 carts, that's not worth it. But if it's two dollars, it might be nice to have it. Can you buy anything for two dollars? I don't know. Well, even even if they were, I think even if they were thirty dollars for the for the use over five years, you know, it might be might be worth it. But right. 
that's just something a little. I'm yeah. in favor of. I'm in like you. I'm in favor of card covers yeah. or club covers, rain covers. Yeah, agreed. We'll get get an, an option list for you. Yeah, I think that's the itemized list of customization for the cards, and we can pass through that. But the original motion by Steve that was seconded by Tom about replacing the fleet. I'd like to call a vote. All approved, please say aye. 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 Uh, any nays? No one abstained, so we're approved. Motions are approved, so move on with that. And then I guess, Cindy, do you just bring that to the Board of Supervisors and then they reach out to, is that like an open bid process or? Sealed bid. Okay. Still bid. Uh, Perry's got all the information. He'll put it together based on what he's done in the past. We'll um, get that option list out to you and, and you can decide. Maybe we can do a, a poll just so we can keep it moving forward. Okay. Um, you think there's any chance we could get that in between meetings just so people would be able to yes. review that prior? Yeah. Well, yeah, we'd have to decide on those options before the bid goes out. Okay without knowing what the cost of the options are? It would be listed as part of the alternate. Okay. I mean, yeah, I think when we're looking at the options, I don't think we need to overwhelm ourselves. I think, you know, we don't need, we don't have to have coolers on the side, but I think all those things, I think two things that I like, the USB plug and the hood for the golf, golf clubs. Those two things are pretty key. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so before we get into old business, one of the other action items, it's not, I don't know if it's really action item, but we had kind of talked about goal setting and we've kind of pushed it off meeting after meeting. I'd like to at least discuss that before we move on to some of the other items, because it seems like we, we run out of time. And I think as Tom had said in, you know, three or four meetings ago, it's important to keep kind of our eye looking down the road as opposed to, you know, what's immediately in front of us. So even if we just take five, 10, 20 minutes, whatever it is to just talk about what it is overall for the authority that we look to do in the future, um, I'd like to just have an open discussion. Um, so I had one or two items to, to talk about, uh, but, you know, don't certainly don't want to set the, the stage for the, the conversation. So um, if anybody has anything as far as what they're looking to do for future goals, for the authority, for the property, for even just golf operations, I want to kind of open the floor and just have a discussion. So, um, and that goes for Doug, Jim, anybody on the, uh, on the board um, that wants to discuss anything. So I'll leave it open. Well, I think we'll, I guess what we would suggest is start a list, right? Of potential objectives. I think that's a, that might be a good place to start. Um, the first one I'll put out there is um, the range. Um, should we keep it? Can the, can the property that it sits on be used more efficiently? or better for the community. Um, I guess maybe start with, do, do we need a range? And we would obviously need some, uh, uh, some input from Jim. Uh, I have a question for Jim regarding the, the range. Jim, did, did, those, did those orders or those new um, reduced distance golf balls come in? Yes, they came in. We've been using them with the uh, junior camps and they're working awesome. So if there is a option to keep the range, we definitely can and the balls will stay within the driving range. One of the one of the members that are using these balls saying do they are they happy with them to where you think ultimately the range could could be um, a money maker? Well, currently it's just juniors. The pro went out and hit them, and he said they they fly like a normal ball. They just don't go the distance a normal ball will go. 
but you can work the ball like you normally, you know, would on a driving range to try to practice, whether it's a uh, fade cut. So it could be obviously used at the range. We could use it for lessons. We can use it for tournaments. You know, it's never going to be a huge money maker. It never, the plan was never for it to be that. Thank you. I guess my thought with the range would be um, until we have something that's going to take its place, I don't see the need to go out of our way to remove it if it's being used or utilized by the for lessons and things like that. Um, but I would say that if we have an idea or opportunity with that space, then you know we can do more of a cost benefit analysis of that piece of property. What about converting it to a miniature golf course? They like that idea. How did that work when it was on the front lot? Was not what the none of us are that old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I honestly can't I couldn't am, tell I you that. Right. Was have, it a draw or was it yeah I think I I mean I think it, it's a draw. It's it's um I think if you if you go around the county, um I think miniature golf courses are being used, you know, by by families. It's a it's a it's sort of a recreational family friendly type thing, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, um and I think that I think there's a possibility. I guess, you know, I guess just to sort of step back here, um, I don't know that we need to, um, uh, you know, make a decision about uh, a driving range or a uh, miniature golf course or um, maybe even considering a new pro shop. But I but I think there are something things that we should be thinking about. That that's all and and discussing. Mm -hmm. uh, and at this point not rule in or rule out. I think the, um, you know, I bring up the um, <clears throat> uh, the driving range within the context of the ground it sits on, the area that it takes. Um, and I also look at the um, uh, maintenance facility that we have that sits sort of in the middle of the, of the, of the, of the track of land. Mm -hmm. um, you know, should we at some point consider uh, moving that to a different location uh, uh, on the on the property that does does it make sense? Uh, uh, is there anything more than we than we can get out of the current building uh, footprint that's that's there now? Uh, you know we've got blue collar in there. Um, you know, sort of going back to something that um, Dan uh, suggested. Uh, a while back, uh, indoor driving, in, indoor golf uh, type of a, uh, of a yeah. setup. Uh, you know, just get something. Put just trying to get something in the hopper. That's that's all, and then we can uh, see where we go from there. That's. You know, I, I kind of like where you're going with this, Tom. Because I think one of the things I wanted to mention was when we first started out, we were so focused on do we want to play convenience store out front. Now we're kind of moving back to where we're looking for something more family friendly and recreational in that respect. I know we're going to have to determine the best offer when we finally make that decision, but which way are we leaning right now? Are we leaning more toward the recreational end of things? Because that does bring in miniature golf, that does bring in simulator. It, bring, it, it just, I think, it opens up other opportunities versus just the business end of it. Are we just going to plop down something? To generate instant revenue, guaranteed mm. revenue right. for the township. You know, is, is it just is it important to generate more re revenue? We should be we should be discussing that. You know, uh, uh, you know what what's the ultimate objectives? I'm not a golfer, but what about multi-purposing the the driving range and convert it to a miniature golf course? But then they have different hours where you could actually just set up the tees and, and the people could come in and drive the golf balls. And then when that ended, you'd be able to have the other people come in and play miniature golf. I would imagine that the demographics are different and the time that people would want to come over there would be different. 
because people might want to come over and, and practice before they go on their rounds and play. And then later in the day, after four o'clock, a lot of people aren't going to show up because they're not going to have time to play a full round. You, you could switch over and, and use the miniature golf course. It wouldn't impact at all what, what the surface was between the, the driving tees and defenses because all they're trying to do is see how, how far they can hit the ball. I, I do know that one of the trends right now is, even with mini golf, is they're building in, <clears throat> pardon me, indoor facilities for, for miniature golf. So we, I think if we went that direction, we may have to ask ourselves, do we want to just limit it to a May to October type of setup, or we want to do something that can encompass all 12 months? So I think everything's on the table in that respect. But the cost involved to go indoors I don't, I don't disagree. As is the cost that needs to be addressed of, what would happen if the maintenance building was moved somewhere else? Because that's right smack in the middle of a prime piece of ground. And that's going to, I think that's one of the first decisions that needs to be made, in my opinion. Right. And I, I don't disagree with you one point. I don't disagree with you one point. I'm just trying, for me, I'm just trying to think of the goals of which. I understand. Something I just thought of actually now was we keep talking about moving the maintenance building, which makes sense, but not necessarily destroying the structure. I mean, maybe that structure can be reutilized for something different. I mean, space, it just needs to be prettied up. Um, but maybe reutilizing the building. It could essentially become a little clubhouse for a miniature golf next to it. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know. I'm not familiar with how big that building is. I've never been in, been in right. it before, but I'm I mean, not sure how yeah. big it is. For a miniature golf facility, you know, you know, for their shop or office store front, you don't need a whole lot, but. Oh, you're just saying for the, like the storefront, you wouldn't have the mini golf in the maintenance building. Not in, yeah, not in the maintenance building. I don't, I mean, I think indoor would be just a little bit, unless we have somebody willing to come in and, right. and actually or... invest and build. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, my thoughts are kind of with Tom too. Where, where do we draw the line on how much revenue we, we need to push out of there versus keeping it family oriented? You know, how can we benefit the rec benefit blue collar, benefit the golf course, you know, can we add a pavilion that the rec can use for the camps, you know, when they need to, or the tournaments that they hold or whatever, you know, have more space overflow. People can get food from blue collar and sit out there. Um, a lot of things to think about, but I, I think going back to the convenience store thing, I think we kind of exhausted that a little bit. Nobody wants to lease land or at least none of these big guys anymore want to lease land. They want to purchase it. And that's not what we're interested in. Well, and I think back to the, uh, the original kind of thought of the authority was, you know, get the course back in the black. That was goal one. I would say more or less that's been accomplished. So now I would say we can be a, a little bit more uh, pointed with what we want to do as far as whether it's inside the existing structure, altering it, or just on the grounds in general, um, we're not looking at necessarily revenue as our, or you know that, that maybe that is the main factor about what we're looking at. But I feel like now we have the flexibility to look at maybe something that either the township can use, or something that can promote the golf course or the restaurant more, or something that you know affects the bottom bottom line for the the township. Um, but you know, what does that mean as far as you know, do we, do we lease property? Do we lease or lease land? Do we lease part of the, the remaining structure that blue collar hasn't touched to another entity? Um, hopefully that would promote their business, but, um, and the, and the golf course, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there are a few questions still remaining as far as kind of where we go from here. I mean, I, I like where you're going with that in terms of usage. I would back up a second and just comment that on the revenue side of, of uh, this, I think we're still a ways away from uh, generating enough money to subsidize the golf course to a break even. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think if we had another six grand a month coming in, we, uh, we'd be a lot, we, we could say we're almost there, mm -hmm. but uh, I think we still need to, look at revenue generating uh, opportunities at the same time, uh, not steer away from 
uh, resident friendly, family friendly uh, uh, activities. Because at the end of the day, that's who we're here to serve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm I, with Tom on this. For many years, I've talked about if we don't divest of the golf course at the township level, then we need to do whatever we can to make it financially self-sufficient. And I think part and parcel to that would be that anything on that frontage at church and Stony Battery, we need to maximize our opportunity. If we stay family friendly or recreation oriented, that's all fine and dandy. But I think the overriding desire, at least it, it was for me and is what was my impetus for participating in getting the recreation authority started is to do whatever we can to make sure that the golf course facility is self-sufficient and isn't a drain on the township resources because otherwise, in my opinion, it's not a wise stewardship of other people's money. And in this case, it'd be the taxpayers. I just wanna read Sue McMullen did put something in the chat here uh, in regards to the range at the sod farm. So we discussed a range at the sod farm and it was my understanding that the sod farm for the board of supervisors was at least at the time off limits for potential fields for the high school or for the, the school system. It's currently outside of the recreations lease. So Sue, we don't necessarily have the ability to do anything with the sod farm. Although we, we, that was discussed several times throughout the years. Um, but no, Doug, I, I, I agree with your point um, as well. And I, 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 going back to the numbers, um, I thought with at least looking at a full fiscal year of blue collar that we were in the black, but I guess that was without the HVAC costs. And then now on top of that would be the golf cart cost, which I mean, I don't think amortized over the five years might right. look a little bit more. I don't more think any of smooth, it's going to happen overnight, but I think we have the writing on the wall started yeah. to get there. Um, but yeah, I don't. I'd like to address Mrs. McMullen's comment about the, the snack bar not being open. That is true that it, it closes relatively early, but blue collar was now open till 11 p.m. So golfers can go in and, and have a beer and eat. And I've been in there several times around 6 or 6.30 and the, the bar is full. So I, I think there is a definite um, ability for people to, to, to linger after the golf rounds now. Good. Okay. So I guess where we go from here in regards to our objectives. Um, I, I would say that at least one of the immediate things I'm thinking of is reaching back out to, was it Chris at the Club Nut about the golf simulators? I think that was one of the discussions that we had with him, but it was unfortunately married, I think, to the idea of a restaurant. And his business was not necessarily going to work if they did not have food service or beverage service. Um, so, you know, m maybe at least having an initial conversation with him to see if he still has an appetite for something like that, um, I, I think could be something that we ask the uh, business development committee to, you know, maybe try to spearhead that reach out to him and, and really maybe even bring in blue collar and see if they would have any appetite for something like that as well. If they have a, you know, whether it's, he does it himself, if he if decides he wants to do that, or if he and blue collar want to have some type of joint venture where they have some revenue share or something like that. Um, which I guess for us as 10, you know, in charge of, uh, the two tenants, whatever they want to work out, as long as we have a lease with him, you know, that, that can be kind of on their own. But um, I think having a discussion with him to get re-engaged might be worth, you know, the 
the business development's time to, 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 to look at that. So um, as a potential new tenant, um, from there though, I would say it might be worth having each member or, you know, even maybe even looking at a, a separate committee as far as, um, you know, kind of uh, to think of some ideas as to where we go from here, you know, assuming all the other items that we're addressing at each meeting, you know, are, are we're continually addressing those, but it's not anything new. It's all kind of old business that we're more or less looking after. Could, could I suggest we circulate a list based on our meeting tonight, have each board member or commi commission member uh, comment with, with some thoughts, put all the thoughts together, and then that'll give us some idea maybe, you know, directionally where we want to go. Um, maybe if we, pri you know, uh, we probably have five or six things, maybe even more, um, you know, prioritize them. Each person would prioritize them in terms of what they felt were important. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we talk about them at the next meeting. Maybe we add some, maybe we take some off. Something, something along that line. Okay. The other thing we want to, might want to consider is working from other and work back. What would we not feel would be an appropriate use for the property? You know, when the board, when this authority was first started, we were presented a bunch of alternatives. It was a mixture of offices and a convenience store and everything else. And I think, I think we ought to establish fairly early on what we do not feel is the appropriate use. And I think that would help us down the road to hone in on what the a more appropriate use might be. Because that's one thing that is going to have to be addressed at some point. So just a thought. Yeah. No, I, I think that's both good ideas. Um, and just to generate some ideas for what we want to do for the property. So, um, OK. So I think that's a good idea. We'll have each member, if they can, you know, maybe list two, three, four ideas for not just the land parcel, but you know, maybe even the existing facility, or you know, kind of their wish list of of items to do. Whether it's you know, like Tom had said, a a new pro shop. Well, you know, we had talked about an outdoor pavilion um, that was over in the kind of the, the barn area, kind of closer to the tent tee box, I think. Um, you know, so just a few ideas as to, you know, what we want to do, um, you know, going forward. So uh, just everybody make a mental note of that. And then, you know, we can follow up with, uh, with an email just to kind of put that back in everybody's ear, you know, maybe next week or the week after. Um, all right, so that was about 20 minutes of just goal setting. So I wanna move on to the rest of the agenda items unless somebody else has any other comments for the kind of open discussion. All right, uh, golf operations update. Jim, did you have anything that you wanted to add? No, nah, it's just another good month, June. And then uh, for July, we've actually uh, already met what we did last year. And uh, we're actually 10 grand above where we were at at the end of the month. So we should end up right around 15 grand plus above. That's, that's great news. Would you say that's weather related or just overall enthusiasm for the game of golf has increased this year? <laughs> Uh, it's all on the pricing strategy that was in place. Okay. Good. All uh, right. I got, a, I got a question for Jim. Go ahead, Tom. Um, hey, Jim. Um, I had somebody approaching with uh, actually two people approaching with questions are sort of sort of related and tied together. Um, number one, uh, he asked me if. We had a hundred, is the golf course marked out with 150 yard markers on the golf course? And this, the, the other question I had had to do with, is there a way that we can um, provide some yardage 
um, measurement from sprinklers. You do see that on a lot of golf courses where from a sprinkler head, it's 270 yards or 170 yards. Have we ever done that? Yes, currently we have this in the fairways for 150, 200, and then 100. And then we're putting uh, the uh, yardage on sprinkler heads as well. We started that last year. Okay. And then we also have a uh, yardage book that is free of charge and that gives all the yardage in there. Awesome, thank you. Yes. Any other questions for Jim? Sounds, sounds look good. All right, uh, HVAC replacement project. Cindy, did you wanna give an update on that or is there anything new? Nothing new, we st we're still in a holding pattern waiting for that uh, economizer for unit five, which is in the restroom area and hallway. So the kitchen unit's up and running, all the other units are up and running. Um, we paid one invoice, we're holding about 42,000 on the contract. Did they give an update as far as the timeline for the- They have no clue. Liebold has no clue. They, they can't get information out of train. Um, it's just kind of a, yeah. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that's not uncommon. Are we considering any penalties for, for Lee Mold? We're not because it's beyond their control. I think we'd be hard pressed to actually get those. Okay. I mean, there's just, I mean, I can have uh, our attorney check the contract to see if it's feasible. Any other HVAC questions, comments? Uh, Sue, I'm gonna get to your question about the golf course when we get down to public comments. So just hold on tight. Um, <coughs> blue collar liquor license. So they finally received a, a temporary <coughs> liquor license it's good to August the 15th. The assumption is that that's how long it takes to get the paperwork through the PLCB. So it's just, it's just a matter of paperwork now. They passed their inspection, they can <coughs> purchase liquor. Um, we've reconciled our accounts. Joe's moved all the money to where it needs to be. So Blue Collar's happy, we're happy. Uh, we're not doing their accounting for them any longer. I want to be as optimistic as the next guy, but I'm assuming that on August 16th, if it hasn't come through, we're back in the reconciling business. I'm afraid so. Okay. I was going to say our next <clears throat> meeting is until August 25th. So mm -hmm. that's 10 days after this is supposed to happen. So is there anything that we need to, it, nothing it, we can it's do? It's literally I guess. just paperwork. Okay. okay. That blue collars? <laughs> I think it's waiting LCB. to do or it's in the, okay. It's LCB. PLCB's problem yeah. there. There's multiple other problems going on with them right now too. So <laughs> I think that just nobody's working over there. That's the that's the biggest thing. <laughs> Nobody wants to do anything. And, and to be clear, there's no issues or potential issues that is holding this back. That's correct. Okay. Otherwise, it would not have gotten temporary. Okay. okay. Any questions? Blue collar liquor license related. Uh, Liberty. Still nothing or nothing. I mean, I think any guess as to why is it just we <coughs> it, I, I'm trying to remember we countered. They just said no. Right. And then they didn't offer a. Yeah, yeah. nothing. No. Crickets. I don't know if that's good or bad. You know, does that mean they're shopping for another site for the tower would be my guess or? My guess is that they have 20 people that they're trying to talk to. But we hold the best spot. That would be my guess. Uh, yeah, I don't I have no idea. <clears throat> I know that I'm in favor of it. 
getting it done because I lose service driving into my development every time. <laughs> <laughs> but you always get the That's, disclaimer about someone who's driving on Centerville Road and just be like, hey, if I lose, yeah, FYI. Yeah, I mean, so I'm on it, Centerville it does, Road. You, you lose it every time right there. Um, I think we should consider at least opening a, we don't, we don't have to go back with a counter to them, we, but go back to say, do you have any response, you know? Or, you know, is there a response to our rebuttal besides the no? Do you have other options? What do you, where do you stand? And who gave them the word to respond? Did Frank send it to them? Frank uh, corresponded with them, yes. Okay. I mean, we can delay that for another month if we want to, but I don't know that there's really any harm trying to reopen that with them or just at least touching base to say, hey, you guys still interested? We appreciate the courtesy of a reply. But they gave us a reply. No. Yeah, yeah the reply, no. Yeah. So the only thing that we would do at this point would say, is your answer still no? You know, I don't know. <laughs> That's a negotiating <laughs> really tactic. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, I think, I think we all agreed that their original offer was low and our offer or our counter was high, but that's how negotiation starts. And then they stopped it. So, Oh, I think the other point of that was at their level, it wasn't necessarily worth going through the motions of putting a cell tower there. If that's what the revenue was going to be to the township. So if they weren't willing to come up from that or, or even offer a counter, then I would say at this point, we just would wait. I don't, I don't know that we benefit by trying to negotiate our number down if they're not gonna negotiate their number up. I think Mike had also indicated that he had, had done some research and there was like maybe two or three other companies that he was maybe gonna reach out to. I think that was Mike, that wasn't you, Doug, was it? No, I don't recall doing that, although I will say I'm inclined to agree with the chair with what he said there about just taking a, a waiting position. Yeah, so Mike might have some more insight into that if he's at the next meeting. Yeah, okay. Any questions? Comments, Liberty Tower? Okay. The SRBC. Yeah, we're just kind of sitting on that. Nothing happening. They're collecting data. Um, just wanted to keep it on the agenda so that it's still up front. Can you remind? I don't remember what that. Sorry, SRBC is the Susquehanna River Basin, and we have to get a permit from them every ten years to withdraw money or to withdraw <laughs> <laughs> money does flow out, but <laughs> withdraw water for the golf course. Yes, okay. irrigation. Yeah. Uh, last we spoke to them, they wanted to negotiate with Hemphill Water Authority, and they've been doing that for years. Um, and they wanted to finish that first, and they thought they could do that. At this point, I think that was late last year, and it's still not done before they attempted ours. Does ours run out at any point? It runs out. We have to submit by November, but if they are holding us up, they will give us an extension of submittal. Okay. So nothing to do there? Nope. nope. Okay. Can you give us some idea of what we paid the last time we went through this process? It has no comparison because about maybe two, three years ago, they significantly increased fees. So it was like maybe $100 for a permit. Now it's probably 10. So. 10,000? 10, 10,000, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. 100 to, 100 to 10,000, well. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable, and it, their restrictions are, are very odd. They might restrict you from withdrawing what you've been withdrawing forever, uh, and they're difficult to deal with. Uh, Hemphill Water has taken them to court. That's why they're not settled out yet. Hmm. Okay. Any questions, SRBC? Comments, all right. Uh, expanded use of building and grounds. I feel that that was, that was the, the discussion that yeah. We, yeah, we moved to the front of the list. So I'm gonna check that one off. Um, do we have any new business other than what we already discussed? Uh, 
uh, minutes of the previous meeting. I was not at the, so procedurally, can I? You can ask for a, a motion in a second. Okay. Uh, motion to approve the minutes from June 23rd. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? I'm going to abstain because I wasn't present. I will as well. I was not present. Three to two. Yep. Four, right? Four. They seconded it. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, Ms. McMullen, your question about the golf course open earlier than 7 a.m. Jim, do you want to speak to that about the times? Yeah, we're going to stay at uh, 7 a.m. There's not demand before that to justify opening any earlier. There was tea times at 6, 6-ish six several years ago, was there not? Yeah, we had times uh, probably about three years ago, but we never filled them. So it was just a waste of labor and electricity and everything else. So that's why we moved to seven. And you allow people to go out earlier without a tea time. Is that accurate? Correct. We've got some groups that will come out and they walk nine holes and then they check in when we open up and pay for their round at that time. And that's okay. Is that just kind of an unwritten rule that's not in the clubhouse anywhere? No, they've just reached out to me, and that's the agreement we made. Okay. Okay, I just would note that Overlook and Tanglewood are both open by around 6.30, according to their tea times that are online. And they seem to be doing well with that. I don't know. Well, so Sue, I think what, what, what Jim was saying there is that if you have the need to play at 6 a.m., 6.30, uh, you can certainly reach out to him in the clubhouse and start your round and stop in afterwards to settle up. Without a card, though. Yeah, without a card. I'm sorry, we didn't hear that. Uh, there won't be any card. I wasn't actually asking for me. I had heard someone, one of my friends spoke to someone who was interested in playing an early morning round of golf. He ended up making a 7 a.m. tea time at Four Seasons and was a little upset when he got there and found that he was like the 16th person waiting in line to get off the first tee. Um, and he had plans to play a quick round and go to work. So he was a little unhappy when it took him four and a half or five hours to finish his round behind the people who had started ahead of him. Because he thought he had the first tee time. So I'm just... Yeah, it's, it's fine to let people go out ahead of time, but if somebody thinks they have the first tee time and then they find out they're behind a lot of people. He said to my friend who recommended that he come to Four Seasons because he could get the first tee time at 7 a.m. Uh, he said he wouldn't come back. But I'm just telling you that. Thank you. Okay. Jim, do you see that's the case normally? You have a, a bunch of people waiting to tee off at 7 a.m.? No, that's the first I've heard of that. We have a, two groups of members that go out. But most other days, we've got leagues that we're blocked off for, so there's no play going out. Maybe that was a one-off situation. Sue, I'm not really sure. 
with Jim's comments. Jim, would, would it, I mean, and obviously I know like, you know, early spring, late fall, 6 a.m. tea times aren't really. No, doable. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you need to do that early or, or late in the fall, but sometimes people do want to be out earlier. Yeah, Jim, would it be something that we could look at possibly down the road or next year, you know, maybe just Friday, Saturday, Sunday being open at, you know, or take it starting tea times at 630 or something like that, you know, it doesn't have to be 545, you know, sunrise, but I think maybe 630 we can draw, you know, we can draw in and book those tea times. Yeah, like I said, we've tried that over the years and they, we get one time, so it's not worth opening that early for that. Jim, I have a question. I'm not a golfer, and this is going to sound like a silly question. Is, do you, have you ever um, allowed people to tee off on a hole other than the first hole? So people can start, multiple people can start earlier? Or is the course not set up to be able to do, it, do that that easily? No, there's times where we'll do a double tee we do that a lot in the afternoon with uh, when we have, you know, we've got a couple nights where we've got three or four leagues that go out. So we do a double T and we have them going off both nines. So if there was a, if there was a problem with a line waiting in the morning, you could, you could allow a, a double, double T times or double T locations and handle it that way. Yeah, no groups coming out where they just want to do nine holes and then go to work. We always send them off the opposite side of our play for that day. The problem is if you have two people playing or if you have two groups playing 18, someone tees off 10 at 7 a.m., someone tees off at 1 at 7 a.m., and then you have tee times 9, 10, 11 o'clock, the people who teed off at 10 and are trying to go off at 1 are now throwing a kind of a, a wrench in the – Okay. Nine o'clock, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock. It it works more in the afternoon if you don't have a lot of play because once it gets dark, the carts have to be in by a certain okay. time, so you're out of time. But yeah, that's why you limit it to uh, nine hole play. Yeah, in the mornings makes sense. Any other public comment? I uh, make a motion to adjourn. Second. Just, I've got something for Mrs. Schweitzer. I understand that uh, there's been some changes in the Sunshine Law. Correct. Uh, will any of those changes impact anything that we're doing here? Or do they apply to us? They do apply to you. They, they do. Okay. Um, so your agenda has to be posted 24 hours ahead of time. Right. Has to be posted at the building, which was always the case. Um, if we add anything to the agenda during the meeting. It has to be approved by the, the commission. And then the amended agenda needs to be reposted the next it's day. Similar to what we do with um, on the board, where yes. if we something comes up at the last minute, we ask that that be added to the formal agenda and then we take it. And, okay, right. so procedurally, there's some things that we have to do different, differently, perhaps. Yes, yes. Okay. So, so if you um, say, if you decide on an action item tonight, at the end of the meeting, you would really need to take a vote to allow it to occur. The other, th and then it would be added to the agenda. You could take your action. And then I would have to post the agenda the next day on the website. I forgot that the website is 24 hours ahead. Um, the other thing that you may want to consider too, as you're moving through your agenda is if you do have a motion in a second, and then you want to ask for public comment right. under every motion to allow that to occur. Do we need to do that for the carts that we had a vote on? Technically speaking, yes. Should we do that now? I don't think it's necessary. Okay. I think Sue would have, would have asked a, her question had she had one. I guess she technically did, yeah. Okay. We have to ask for public comment to adjourn. Mm.
Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, did I, I had a second to adjourn? Yes. 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 Okay. Now, yeah. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 Oh, opposed? We are so adjourned. Thank you, everyone. So it doesn't matter that we went out of um, order for the agenda, right?